Aloha and welcome to Figments, The Power of Imagination. This is season one, episode two, he says, grandiosely. The whole idea of this show is to inspire you and entertain you, and I think we're really going to do that today. Uh, first, I'll talk about a figment of my own. Every golfer, I think, has a figment when they walk up to the tee on a par three of, well, either a dream, making hole in one, or a nightmare. Uh, putting it in the water, the sand, whatever the hazard is. So bring up my picture from Saturday, uh, my dream came true. Number two at Mamala Bay, 179 yards. And it was a figment, then it became real. And it, re it makes up for every bad shot I've made and there are millions of them. So enough about that figment. We've got a great show today, a great guest, an old friend and somebody you'll really enjoy getting to know. The intro is simple. It's General Dave Goldfein, retired U.S. Air Force Chief of Staff, and he's going to talk about a figment consistent with our uh, with our theme here, where we we take something that resided in the in the imagination and make it real. And he did that. And a reminder: here's the definition of a figment. And actually, here's Dave Goldfein fingers. My good friend, the retired 21st Chief of Staff of the Air Force, he served for 37 years and uh, was a fighter squadron commander, group commander, twice wing commander, combat in Desert Storm and Operation Allied Force. Now he's in San Antonio, Texas, and he says he's life and retirement a lot. Aloha, General Goldfein. Hey, aloha, Pig. Thanks for having me. Oh, pleasure, pleasure. And uh, we have a lot of connective tissue. We could take an hour just discussing our connective tissue. Amen. Um, and it kind of starts with a squadron of some repute, the world famous, highly respected triple nickel that we both got to command, right? Yep. Amen. Yep. And well, there's a night, like no squadron like it. And uh, that was long before you stood up and testified uh, or sat down and testified to get confirmed as the 21st chief of staff. But and to lot, me- And a lot more fun, can I just say? Oh yeah, nothing like it. And um, as I thought about that, to me, uh, Dave Fingers, you are every man's fighter pilot, every woman's uh, colleague, coworker, fighter pilot. Uh, there's a humble, you know, common person to you that that we all admire. And I have to ask you, when you first sat in the office of the chief of staff of the Air Force, in charge of the whole darn thing and sat behind the desk, did you ever have a fleeting figment that maybe somebody would catch you and ask you what the heck you were doing in there? I actually lived in constant fear, especially <laughs> during my, my confirmation hearing that, uh, that Chairman McCain would, would raise a piece of paper, you know, lean forward in the microphone and say, um, hey, General Goldfein, I, I happen to be holding the transcript from your Air Force Academy days. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> you were class of 83 at the game? Actually, I, I joke, I was the class of 81, 82, and 83. I, I, I was the John Belushi of the Air Force Academy. And that's what I wanted uh, to allude to, was the 81, 82, 83, but you were the top graduate in philosophy, as I recall. And I only uh, yes. know this because you told me. Number one and of one. One of one, and I think you to also told me you were marching tours, a form of punishment that we didn't have at the University of Wisconsin, right up to graduation. As a matter of fact, I had to uh, call my physics instructor to ask whether he would share with me whether I was going to uh, pass and graduate because I was planning on getting married the next day. And I asked him, I said, hey, sir, if you don't mind just telling me right now if I flunked and I'm not gonna graduate, I can save my family, a lot of money, a lot of hassle. And he said, well, he goes, I got good news and bad news there, Cadet Golf. And he said, good news. He goes, you, you're going to graduate. You passed. You can get married. He said, the bad news is uh, you will never return to the academy as a physics instructor. <laughs> well, you weren't planning to do that anyway, right? No. Because you come from a distinguished family of fighter pilots. Your dad was a an icon of the fighter community. He had served in Vietnam in the world famous, highly respected triple nickel. And as I recall, when you pinned on Colonel, there was, was there over a hundred years of commission service in the room from the gold fields? Sure, sure was, yeah. Older brother, Steve, who uh, retired yep. uh, as you know, two-star uh, general, uh, acting director of the joint staff at the time. And 
my younger brother, Mike, who uh, retired active duty as lieutenant colonel and went on to be a reserve F-16 instructor for many years. Mm -hmm. what and a now family. next generation is there with my daughter serving as an intelligence officer and my nephew is at pilot training right now in uh, at Shepherd, and my other nephew is a squadron commander flying eagles. Um, cool. He's got the finally a fighter pilot. Yeah, that's right. I, my my background was mostly in F-15, so a little bit of rivalry there. But, um, and our connection started before we knew it started because mm -hmm. we were at Luke Air Force Base at the same time doing different things. Yes, I was requalifying in the F-15, and you were in your initial. F-16 training. And do you remember the conversation we had in the triple nickel bar at Aviano in December of 1998? Boy, do I ever. <laughs> yeah. yeah, when this one guy, this guy lost his brakes in an F-15 and was coming right at me. Yeah, so the, the way I remember, you said he was coming right at you, or no, he said, you said, were you there at Luke when that happened? And of course I said, was I there? Why, that was me. And I had lost all brakes and steering and uh, it should have been killed. And you are the only one who saw it. For 10 years, I didn't know how I survived and then you enlightened me. And that's another 15, 20, 30 minute sort story best mm -hmm. told with cold beverages. So um, we'll leave it there. And then we linked up again at Aviano Air Base in Italy um, where you commanded the world famous, highly respected triple nickel and had the joy of having a boss, me as a one-star wing commander, who uh, had commanded the same squadron and took special interest in your work. That had to be yeah. fun. Oh yeah, that was, that was a blast. And, I'll, and I'm sure we'll get to it. I'll, I'll, we'll share with the, the listeners the great fig leaf quote after welcoming me back from Serbia. Yeah, we'll probably get to that. Um, and you were, uh, we had great leaders there. Uh, yes. Really, Jeff Eberhardt, uh, Dave mm -hmm. Nichols, all the guys who came into Squadron, and, and it was a, a time. I, I would suspect that many of you this today won't be aware or won't recall what a big effort Operation Allied Force was, because it was kind of in the background news. There were no ground troops. It was right about the time of the tragic Columbine shootings. It took up a lot of the media bandwidth, and so... Uh, it didn't make a lot of news, but it was important. And we, I'll speak for you and me and the folks who served with us, because this this is what I've heard. We felt like we we're doing something right and important and yeah. trying to stop ethnic cleansing. Yeah. And, you know, it was so, so unique, too, because, you know, you and I had discussed the fact that, you know, fighting from home where our families yeah. lived yeah. Uh, was not in the brochure. And so yeah, we... So we had to work our way through that and and our spouses today you know that went through that with us their their war stories are as good as anything we have to tell yeah it was a lot harder i think on them than on us because we were doing something we believed in and you know if you train to be a warrior um, for all of your life you don't you don't want war but if it's there you want to be in the game if it yes if it becomes reality you want to be involved in it and we were in a in a unique way in a war that where the principal application of military power was from the air. Mm -hmm. I think I picked words that won't irritate our army guys too much, yeah. our army friends too much. But yeah, it was the truth. Now that was not your first combat experience, right? Right. No, I, I, I you know my career was I was I was quite lucky actually, because like you say, you know you never wish for war, but if there's one to be waged, you want to be part of it because it's what you mm -hmm. trained to do, and you want to. Do it with your values intact and and there's nothing better than leading a squadron into mm -hmm. combat and uh and so i had the privilege of of flying on the wing of an incredible warrior in desert storm a guy named i think we both know uh, billy deal and you know billy's I'm, i remember my first time going into combat and it's like every you know every aviator who's ever gone in for that first time you know, it's the advert, everybody's prayer, right? Don't let me, don't let me screw this up. Absolutely. Don't let my buddies down, right? And you always sort of wonder, man, am, am I trained? Am I ready? And I'll never forget that first, you know, trip across the line into Iraq in Desert Storm. And uh, our, our lead, Billy Deal, and I was his deputy mission commander. 
he's calling out threats like it's a walk in the park. Of course, he's a Vietnam vet, MIG killer. Mm -hmm. The rest of us are green. And he, and he says, hey, there's AAA, you know, right two o'clock, which is anti-aircraft artillery. And we look down and we're looking at it. He says, okay, there's some, and he calls it out like, there's SA-2, surface air missiles, left 10 o'clock. And we're watching these telephone poles come up at the formation. And then I hear a splash, MiG-29. And one of the Eagle guys, of course, you know, shot down a MiG-29 in front of the package. And I remember that moment in my cockpit because I realized that what I was experiencing was not new. I mm -hmm. had experienced almost everything I was seeing, hearing, feeling uh, in red flag at Nellis Air Force Base. Big training exercise for our non-Air Force viewers. And so what I, what I described very often using that experience as chief, I said, you know, in, at the end of the day, that's one of our that's one of our moral obligations as leaders is to produce confidence under fire. We got to produce that same moment that, that Captain Dave Golfing felt because I had been trained well for what I was then asked to do. That's what we owe it to our young folks going forward. And so I became a huge believer in, in training hard, mm -hmm. and, uh, bleeding in training so you don't bleed in combat. And, and that's uh, as real as it gets, um, but you still can't totally dismiss the fear of screwing up, the fear of not being able to pass the test. And I didn't have that moment till I was one star at Aviano. And uh, on my first real combat sortie, I'd flown some pseudo counters, not real demanding missions over Iraq during no fly zone. In uh, enforcement, but I was scared to death and I, I was terrified that I wouldn't be able to do what I'd preached for at that point 25 years. And once you get through that, then all of that training, all of that realistic training, and the fine examples of guys like Billy Deal and all the other heroes we got to learn under comes through. But that first part, I was sweating it. So you were flying over. Um, Iraq, and with your last name being Goldfein, how did you feel about the potential of maybe being shot down and maybe captured in an environment that might not be so friendly? So, you know, this is, it's fun to think back now on, you know, how you, how you approach things as a captain, right? And so, uh, yeah, I was pretty confident that with a name like Goldfein, there would be no POW exchange yeah. uh, for old Goldfein, right? So uh, if I got hit, you know, I, that was it. So I was either going to, either I was either going to walk out on my own or I was not going to make it out. So I got creative like young captains do. And I decided that it would be far uh, better odds for me if I replaced my parachute lowering device, which is what you normally have in the back, you know, on your parachute, because there weren't that many trees in Iraq. So I replaced it with a complete uh, head to toe uh, Arab uh, outfit right, with everything with, from flip-flops mm -hmm. to Gutra, everything. And I talked the, the ID card folks into making me an ID card for combat. And I flew with my, my childhood and college musical hero, his name. So I, I actually flew combat as Harry Chapin uh, the entire time. And luckily I never had to use the card. And we'll get back to that. And we're gonna have to get to that soon. Um, some folks tuning in may have thought we were going to talk about the, uh, the event in May of 1999 where you were shot down and we've got a picture of some relics uh, there. That's the tail of the squadron flagship and the canopy from your airplane when you were shot down and thankfully rescued. Um, worst phone call I ever got was uh, first we lost an airplane. I was wing commander. It's about one in the morning. Well, it was war and we'd already lost an F-117, but when they told me it was you because of our friendship and, and because of your role as the squadron commander and, and with all the respect that you had. Uh, but if it, the next picture goes to the story you talked about. There's uh, you after return with me and Jeff Eberhardt, uh, one of the great combat leaders. Everyone could do a whole show on him too. Oh yeah. But next to it is a picture you gave to me, and, and I didn't zoom in on it too much, but uh, fingers, when you got back to Aviano, I did put my arm around your shoulder and say, you know, I never got shot down when I was a triple nickel commander. 
Uh, of course, I was a triple nickel commander in peacetime in Arizona, but you know, I still never got shot down as the nickel commander. But but all of these vignettes and figments aren't what I want to talk to you about because there's one story that I only know part of that is really extraordinary. So uh, there's a picture of you on a bicycle with a lot of hair. Yeah. And getting back to that. Story, yeah, this, I can't look at that too long, but um, the story I want to get to is uh, I understand that you actually got time off from the Air Force Academy during your course of instruction to take a break and hit the road. Yeah, so oh, yeah. it was, a, let's just say it was a sort of a mutual decision by the Academy leadership and me that um, I was struggling academically, I was doing terribly in the military side of the house, but at least athletically, I was slow. <laughs> so we, we made a mutual decision that I probably, on my current path, was not going to graduate and really need to get, go get my act together. So I actually uh, quit the academy. Now, what they did, oh. there, were, there were 10 of us who they called us in and said, we're going to try something new for U10. This is just where, you know, luck, timing uh, plays. They said, for U10, we think there's a, there's potential here. So if we're going to keep you a slot for you if you want to come back in a year. And on, I think it was March 28th or something like that, they said, you have to call back and tell us yes or no. Are you coming back? So my, uh, you know, I had mentioned that my, one of my passions growing up as a kid was music. And I'd, I'd learned to play the guitar, you know, listening to Harry Chapin, James Taylor, John Denver, uh, you know, Bob Dylan and these guys were all my heroes and and Harry Chapin was especially my hero because I didn't know until I got to the academy that he went to the Air Force Academy class of 1965 and he only lasted through basic training and then I went off to Cornell didn't do well at Cornell and ended up driving a taxi in uh, one of his famous in New York songs. City. yeah and, and if, if I could interrupt just for our viewers who aren't our age uh, we've got a short clip of his iconic song, Cats in the Cradle, and we'll just remind people, and this will be stuck in their heads for the rest of the day. And the cat's in the cradle and a silver spoon, little boy blue and the man in the moon. When you're coming home, dad, I don't know when, but we'll get together then, son. You know we'll have a good time then. And so, um, that's stuck in everybody's head, but that's the guy you wanted to link up with, I guess. Yeah, and so I ended up getting uh, through an academic advisor, a connection to a connection. I ended up actually getting a job as a roadie uh, for in Harry's band. And so I jumped on a 10 speed bicycle, that one in the picture, and left it, uh, left everything I owned, which was, you know, fit into a backpack essentially, uh, with my girlfriend at the time who lived in San Antonio dawn and started pedaling to the to new england to join up with harry's band and that was and i was actually uh three quarters of the way there when he had his tragic car accident and we lost him and so i found myself you know traveling around the country on this bicycle i ended up, I ended up, I ended up traveling for upwards of a year and a funny thing happened you know people took me in as i was traveling yeah found a dog along the way that, that traveled with me, rode on the bike, and I stayed in more people's homes. And I came to the conclusion that this country is worth defending. And those people that took me in, you know, they, what we stand for as a nation, they were the, they were the heart of America, you know, the back rows. So on March 28th, I called back to the Academy and said, if you've got a slide, I'll come back. And I went back and, and finished up. And they, they still are the heart of America. And I know there's a lot of pessimism and it's been a tough year. Every year is a tough year in its own way. Yeah. You know, the, the fig in me would say, suck it up, people. And it's never easy, but people do make it tolerable. And, uh, you know, I had an opposite end, similar experience when I rode my Harley uh, around the four corners of the United States to see the country that I defended. And it was the people. And, and they're wonderful and they're wonderful regardless of any category you'd like to put them in yeah um so you know we it's important that we remember that so you never met harry chapin you still flew with his name on your shoulder um yeah. 
And I understood as I connected with you to talk about doing figments, the power of imagination, got to put a plug in there. It turned out you had just had a Zoom call with his family. You know, I had, that? I had a, uh, they just did a documentary on him that I happened to, somebody pushed to me and I got a chance to watch it. And his brother, Tom, and his son, Jason, were the, the architects of yeah. this documentary. You know, we lost Harry 40 years ago. So, and this guy still has this incredibly outsized impact on his passions, which were world hunger and poverty. And so I, I thought it would be important for the Chapin family to hear a story of how their brother, father inspired this knucklehead cadet who, <laughs> who grew up to be chief of staff of the Air Force. And as I told them, I said, you know, your brother, you know, Harry, uh, I've flown a lot of combat, done a lot of deployment, Don sent me off to war four times. And I said, I, you know, I never went alone. I always had Harry with me. You know, he was either in my head or in my headset and uh, so, made a big difference. Yeah, and I think in your heart too, Fingers, and um, I didn't know much of it, the rest of his story till we connected and I found out you talked to the family. I encourage all of our viewers or both of our viewers, depending on how many we have today, um, to go to the Wikipedia page because he was an incredible ph philanthropist, not just a musician and it, really remarkable. And the way this man was, this man whom you never met, is a lot of the way you are. And I don't know if that's karma, serendipity. This is what his epitaph is on his tombstone from one of his songs written in 1975. And so that's the inspiration for me. Um, you know, if you try to make a difference, improve what your life can be, you, be amazed what you can do and amazed how much it can change the world. And I know that you've, you've done that with your life. And, uh, uh, and I'm honored to know you and call you a friend. So well, we're same, same back at you. And, uh, and I think uh, the viewers should know that um, when it comes to combat leadership, it doesn't get better than fig leaf. And well, when I went on to be have a chance to, to lead my own wings, um, you know, I used to carry around this bracelet that says WWFD. That's all it said on it. And I would just look at it every once in a while and I said, what would Fig do? Really? Well, you've, that's touching. We had a great team. It was a, an incredible time. It always is. And uh, it was the easiest job I ever had because of people like you and because of the cause. So I know you're going to do a lot for the world in your new life. I uh, hope you'll enjoy it. I hope you get out to Hawaii. That is today's view back there. And we got about 28 more stories to share in detail, maybe with the audience in seasons nine through 12 of Figments, the Power of Imagination. There's another plug for you. And uh, fingers, I hope you'll tune in to some of the things we've got coming up. So you can see we're gonna have some uh, two survivors talk about recovery, of keeping the dream of recovery alive. I've got a diplomat who will talk about dreaming of peace and dealing with North Korea. And then Susan Helms, who I'm sure you know is one of the most brilliant, wonderful people, yeah. wonderful. a great astronaut. And then, and then good friends of mine who took figments to screen in Hollywood. So uh, somewhere after that, we'll get you back on, or maybe we'll just get you and Don and I, and we can do our three part. This is the real story <laughs> of your shoot down and rescue. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. So uh, we're uh, about out of time for you. We've got a little more time for the show. Um, is there anything you'd like to close with? One more story about your life where you took something to reality that you didn't expect? Because I know you got a million of them. Well, I would just say that, uh, you know, of all the blessings of being chief of staff of the Air Force, the greatest blessing for me is I got to do it with my best friend and my, uh, my high school sweetheart uh, and for 37 years and 22 moves uh, and four wars, she sent, uh, she was mm -hmm. by my side and still there. And, and, uh, and so this has, been a, this has been a team effort and we're just so honored to have had a chance to really to serve and to be servant leaders. Well, 
uh, Don is awesome. If you'd bring back the picture of the uh, burnt tail and canopy of the F-16, and I'll tell my favorite Don story, you know this one already. We were standing on the ramp at Aviano. You've been rescued in a very hot opposed rescue uh, with the helicopter shot up and some beautifully brave uh, pair of rescuemen protecting you from that. That's a whole nother story. And now you're going to be brought back to your wife and kids' arms and to our, our back to us. Um, and I always say, I had to throw this in there too, fingers. You got off that MC-130, the airplane that brought you back after you were picked up by helicopter, like you were getting off a cruise ship. And I don't know why that's the image that stuck, but it was there was a nonchalance of, okay, I've been shot down and rescued. And uh, Dawn was uh, next to me and she looked up to me. And that's one of the things I like most about Dawn is very few people look up to me physically. And she did. And she said, sir, what are they going to do with the airplane? Because the squadron flagship you'd ejected from and it landed in, the, in Serbia. And I said, what do you mean? So are they going to leave it there? They're not, are they? They're going to bomb it, or are they going to go get it? Her husband's been shot down and rescued, but she's so committed that she wants to make sure the squadron flagship survives. And uh, as I got ready to do this, I put some notices on Facebook. Uh, this talks to what you were saying about the strange nature of fighting from home. Do you remember what you told War Dog Hen uh, Henderson after you were shot down, rescued, and ready to go home? No. So apparently you were telling him, because he was sharing your squadron building with his F-15E yep. squadron, right? Right. At Aviano. And you told him kind of the summary tale of the missile and the ejection and the escape and the pickup. And when you finish, said, and now I'm going to go home and do what every fighter pilot does after they've been shot down. And War Dog said, what's that? He said, and you, Fingers, said, I'm going to go mow my lawn. Yeah, and that's you and every man we believe in and a great exemplar for us a great friend for me and a, hopefully an inspiration for everybody who's watching aloha fingers god bless you thanks. you too Vic. thanks thanks for watching folks be sure you click like and do all that other stuff that gets us street cred on youtube and vimeo aloha